goes east to Salstu. She is to be his. He's evil, a sorcerer who can summon demons. You alone have stood up to their god. And what are you? Be. It is said that they are deceivers. They murder people in the night. Steal my daughter back. I was operating on my own, and I invited a young fellow named Ed Summer to see an early cut of a film called Pumping Iron. And I was sitting with Ed looking at this rough cut of Pumping Iron and couldn't help but notice Arnold Schwarzenegger as an amazing personality. And I said, there must be something that would be right for him as a movie vehicle. And Ed immediately turned and said, well, Conan, of course. So he took me to his comic book store and showed me the world of Frank Frazetta and the world of Conan, which at that point I was not familiar with. And that started me on a journey, first to get the rights, and at the same time meeting Arnold. And together we spent close to five years trying to get the film set up. When Ed Pressman came to me with the project, I have barely even heard of Conan, because we in Europe were much more familiar with other kind of comic book characters. But then when he sent me the comic books and when he showed me all Robert E. Howard's work and uh, Frank Frazetta's paintings and drawings and his interpretation of the look of Conan, I was fascinated by that and uh, fell in love with the project and with the idea. But then, of course, it was then a long road from 1977 to the time we actually wrote the camera. The first script was written by Ed Summer and by Roy Thomas, who was one of the writers at Marvel Comics. They wrote a very interesting and compelling story that could have been the basis of the movie. And ultimately, what got the project really moving was Oliver's script. I had met Oliver Stone through his agent, Ron Mardigian, and William Morris, and he showed me the script for Platoon, which was a remarkable script, and it was evident that he had the talent, and he also had the interest of creating the first Conan movie. The draft I wrote, Conan, the first one, I, wrote, I always undertook it as one of 12. You know, I always thought there'd be like 12 movies, but unfortunately, I feel the producers of the movie misunderstood the real goal, and that they sold it short. And Arnold should have come back every year or two years like James Bond and done one. Oliver's script was like Dante's Inferno. It was hell on earth, and it was a remarkable conception of what the Conan movie could be. I had a lot of mutants, a lot of animals. Uh, I, I was into DNA cloning, all that stuff, a long time ago. I mean, it made sense, right? I never was able to realize it on film, that vision. I saw armies of 40, 50,000 mutants coming at each other, you know. Oliver always wanted to direct, so we, at one point, had the idea that Oliver would co-direct with a special effects expert named Joe Alves, who had done Jaws. We spent a lot of time talking with different directors. We talked to Alan Parker. We spent a lot of time with Ridley Scott. And I remember being in London, and I said, Ridley, or one of the directors we hoped would do it, turned us down, and we were sitting there totally dismayed, not knowing what to do next. We went back to our hotel room that night, and we said, look, Dino De Laurentiis is in London. He's pursuing the rights. He's here at the hotel next door. I get the picture, you know, let's sell out to him now, tonight, and let's have done with it because it's broken our hearts. Said the pressman one day came to see me with the script. He said, Dino, I want to sell this script. What is it about? He said, from famous captain Conor the Barbarian. I read the script, it was a little too violent, but it was a great script. Really great script. 
And then he deal with Ted Bresman and I buy the script. I buy out. And I offered the pitch to, at that time, at Universal, to Ned Tannen. He was in charge of production. He loved the script. I was too violent, we needed to do some rewriting. And I said to Ned, they said, Ned, before we do rewriting, I want to choose a director first. We choose John Milos, because he was a good writer, nice director. We did the rewriting with him, and the directed the movie. I knew nothing of Conan the Barbarian, or Robert E. Howard, or any of the books, or the comic books, or anything, until Oliver Stone came and, and told me about it. The one thing I knew about that I was aware of was Frank Frazetta's paintings. And of course, I love Viking things, and I always wanted to do a Viking movie. And when I was a surfer, one of my first names was Viking Man, because I had this great big sword. Oliver had already written the script, and I read it, and it was really inspirational, probably because it was so insane. And then I saw that I could do a movie that I really wanted to do. I did want to bring this back to a certain historical grounding, and I tried to make everything happen in a history as if it really did happen. In fact, all of the stories of Conan, uh, Howard could have written them all and had all of this in the Dark Ages in a real historical period. Robert Howard, who's a strange bird from Texas, wrote these great stories, most uh, originating in pulp, I believe. He had a great gift for this perverse uh, mythos of darkness and death, and raging and mad Wagnerian mentality. He was convinced that, that you know that the, the town wanted to exterminate him and this kind of thing, and he'd go home and board up his windows, and load rifles, I and mean, a complete nut. But the best part is he's alone one night. He feels a shadow overtake him from behind, and he knows that Conan is standing behind him with a large axe, and Conan tells him, just stay there and write. And if you don't do exactly what I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna cleave you down the middle. And so he's so terrified because Conan just exudes such power and fear, and he can just see the axe glinting in his peripheral vision, you know, that he just writes all night. And of course, with the coming of dawn, he turns around finally and Conan is gone. So he falls upon the floor completely spent and he realizes, I only have to sleep for a few hours because then I must fortify myself for when darkness comes again, so will Conan. And of course, Conan did. And he wrote almost all of these stories in this very short period of time because Conan was standing over him with an ax. And I've always felt this way myself. When I was working on the original storyline that we were developing, we, at the same time, brought in a number of artists to try to create the world for ourselves, but also to present what the film would look like to prospective studios. It was such a visual idea in the first place that we needed to project that. And we had a whole tremendous presentation, which Ron Cobb was a very central part of, along with a number of other artists. I started sitting in on some meetings and did some tentative original artwork, kind of starting to visualize the first version of the script, which was very much in the fantasy vein of the Robert Howard novels. With John's massive rewrite, the picture became very action-oriented and less magical, less fantasy, more like a, uh, an ancient world picture. Everything has a reflection of something that did exist. Nothing is just designed to be fantasy. It has to look like it would really work. Every single cart, every single weapon, everything has to be something that has a practicality and that will work. I was eager to design it. I wanted to be involved in uh, making sure it was just, had the right feel, so I just hogged that job entirely and uh, drew up both of the Atlantean sword and Conan's original sword and supervised the, the making of them. And, and, uh, and in as much as the opening sequence, which uh, uh, I actually directed. On the sword that his father makes in the beginning, it has the, the great elk antlers 
and the hooves on the back and all this kind of thing. And then on the blade it says, suffer no guilt, ye who wield this in the name of Krom. I love the idea of inventing an architectural style that you couldn't quite identify. That was one of the things I wanted to do. You know, kind of design the snake cult so that all the artifacts all look like they fit together. Sort of like corporate logos and things. You know. The symbolism in the picture was actually very important. John saw it that way and I did as well. So we put a lot of time into making sure that they they would resonate on the screen and you'd remember them and uh, fear them or get their significance. You know. Conan, what is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear a lamentation of their women. That is good. From the beginning, it was always the idea of putting Arnold, you know. I mean, we thought of other people, and none of it really worked. Arnold was already a household word. He was a major celebrity. I remember bringing Arnold in, and then Dino had this great desk at the end of this long room, and Arnold walks in and says, what does such a, uh, a little man like you need with such a big desk? You know, typical Arnold. And of course, that freaked Dino out. We had a rather interesting meeting uh, regarding this with Dino, who thought that, uh, you know, no one could understand him. And he said, but Dino, nobody can understand you. I think what got him was I said, you know, Dino, if we didn't have Arnold, we'd have to build him. The interesting thing was that when he became enthusiastic about the fact of me being in a movie. He just did everything possible, you know, to make this really extraordinary and big event movie. And he put a lot of money up there with the studios and he had a lot of confidence in it and all that. So it was from that point on, it was all up to me. Can I follow through? Can I perform up to the expectations that everyone had and all those kind of things? And I, from that point on, took it very seriously. I saw all that jazz, and I saw her dance, the aerorotica dance, and I said, that is a Valkyrie. If ever there's been a Valkyrie on Earth, it is that woman. That's a Valkyrie, and we must find who that woman is. I knew nothing about the movie. I knew nothing about the Conan comics. Um, I had no script. Uh, I went in there. It was basically a meeting. And John Milius, I remember, said, do you want to jump on the end of a tornado and go for a ride? He's probably the grandest storyteller of all times. So the hours that we spent together was him basically explaining the character and the story. John, to me, working with him for the, the months we were together, always made me laugh because the characters are the people. And he's looking for the person that is the person. And I think he goes, your face is right, your stature is right, your athletic ability is right. Who are you? I am Subatai, thief and archer. I am Hakenian. We said, this character should be like Jerry Lopez. And he was a very good friend of mine, my surfing buddy and everything, and never acted. And so we read some people. And I remember I read this one kid who was pretty good in some movie, and he read very well, and the agent wanted some ungodly amount of money for him. And so I said, the hell with that. And I read some other people that weren't good, and I said, well, everybody we want, we like him because they kind of remind you of Jerry Lopez. Why don't we just go get Jerry? He'll be able to do it. And, and so we did. And we tested Jerry, and he tested pretty well. And even Dino was quite surprised. Long before I first read the script, I had been a Robert E. Howard fan and had read most of the Conan books and, and you know, most of his uh, other stories as well. And when John said he was going to possibly do this project, we spent a lot of time together discussing all the stuff about the historical things that the characters were patterned after and stuff like that. For instance, my character in Conan Subatai was patterned after one of Genghis Khan's uh, Mongol generals. So John Millis and I both did quite a bit of reading on the Mongols. Steel isn't strong, boy. Flesh is stronger. I really thought it would be neat to make him look like a race that had disappeared, to have this great James Earl Jones face and then have these stark blue eyes, you know, and uh, 
straight hair so that he would really look like he was uh, part of a, a migration of, of a race that had died out, some superior kind of early Atlantean type of character. And in that way, he sort of played like he is the last of his race, you know, and that he knows more than them and everything, but his race is weakening and this other race is coming in. People tend to have fun with villains and it destroys the credibility. You take uh, Phil Sadoom or, or Darth Vader, have fun with them, I think it's a big mistake. And, and, and what you must do, though, is hire somebody who is essentially a gentle human being, a bear like myself, you know, who, who I don't represent evil in, to, in the media, certainly, but, but uh, and then have me do those, that, that, that dialogue. They should all drown in lakes of blood. Now they will know why they are afraid of the dark. Now they will learn why they fear the night. I think in John Millis's case with uh, Thoughts of Doom, he researched all the evil men of history and it sort of put them all in one, in one voice. What daring, what outrageousness, what innocence, what arrogance. I salute you. The role of, of King Osric was originally supposed to be played by Sterling Hayden, and he got sick. And then I said, well, who would be good? Who could do this if it wasn't Sterling Hayden? And the natural choice was, oh, well, that would you know, be some great character like Max von Sydow. Well, he'll never do this. We'll never get Max von Sydow to do this little role. And sure enough, he said, when do you want, when do you want me? What do you want me to do? And it was kind of shocking when he showed up because I had such admiration for him. My oldest son, when he was in the comic book age, he was very taken by Conan the Barbarian. And I think he encouraged me to, to accept to do this. And I, why I accepted was because I found it was a fun part to do. A lion's ate him. <laughs> it was more theatrical than I was used to do in films. At the time, I was offered very controlled characters uh, without any passions. Uh, and suddenly here was somebody who could take liberties. 154, take one. All I remember really <laughs> is from a scene which is not in the film, which was cut out. And that was after the scene when the, the three thieves are presented to King Osric. King Osric is killed <laughs> among his bodyguards, I believe, who has gone uh, secretly with uh, the snake uh, worshippers. And Milius, who uh, is very fond of swords and uh, decapitations and things, he had figured out that I was not going to be decapitated, but he wanted the man to hit me with his sword right over my stomach, I believe, and almost cut me in half. So I was rigged up with big blood bags all over underneath this costume I had. And and uh, this guy came up to me and uh, tried to kill me and uh, hit me with his sword and I tried to die as, <laughs> as uh, realistically as I could. But he, he missed, so no blood was shown. And Milius was very upset and uh, so another time, a retake. And uh, we did it again and the same result. It was not as spectacular as he wanted. So again, they put up these blood bags. And finally, he hit the right spot, and there was a fountain of blood. And we all fell into paroxysms of laughter because it was so extraordinary <laughs> that it was, un I mean, apparently not usable. So the scene was cut. We needed some great big people. So Arnold knew Sven Ole Thorsen. And Sven Ole Thorsen was like the Jack LaLanne of Scandinavia. There were some other huge characters, and they got them, and I called them all the Great Danes. 
They were like bad puppies. They were always pulling stuff off and practical jokes on everybody. Ben Davidson was separate from them because he came from the NFL and he was a legendary defensive end, the Oakland Raiders, and he was even taller than any of them. And I saw him and I said, that guy would really be great. He'd make a great villain. You. I remember this one thing, we were choreographing part of the fight in the orgy chamber. And I says, Ben, take me and throw me against this pillar. And you throw me so hard, it cracks the pillar, you know. Then you take your ax and swing it at me. And, and I duck, and it just goes right over my head. Well, he threw me against that pillar so hard that it almost did crack. I mean, practically knocked the wind out of me. And I just had, could blink, and here was the ax coming. I ducked that. Ben never did it at half speed. Ben did everything full speed. Valerie Quinesson came from a Willard Hike, really, who'd made a movie called French Postcards. And I had met her, I think, when he was making that movie. And then she came in and read, and she was very good. She read very well as the princess. She was even a very troubled sort, you know, and with a certain kind of sensuality and sort of innocence, and she's quite good. Hey! I'm a wizard, mind you. Mako was a natural choice for the narrator and, and everything because he looks so distinctive and he's a wonderful actor. <laughs> I did something no actor can do. I cut myself out, which proves I'm not an actor. And I had created a thing in there, lizard on a stick, which was like McDonald's. Lizard on a stick, fresh. Look, good and fresh. It was pretty good, but it didn't belong in the movie. It is said that they are deceivers. They murder people in the night. I know nothing. The Ron Cobb stuff stayed in because that did belong in the movie. Black Lotus, Stygian, the best. John Milius had a lot of tricks up his sleeves. He sent me to Mako's acting school. So I went there for about six months. It was a very humiliating experience for me because all his students were all really good aspiring actors and I was a surfer. We did a lot of training with the stunt coordinator, Terry Leonard, a lot of writing lessons, had a lot of martial art lessons. So there was a lot of prep work actually before we got involved in it. We had uh, Yamasaki, who was our sword master, and he really trained them in the art of swordsmanship. And that karate style sword fighting and all of that. Then I'd look at the routine and I would enhance it or detract it just very briefly. I'd have everybody at eight o'clock in the morning for horseback riding till 10, 10.30, and then they'd go off to the gym and work with Yamasaki. It was like really extensive kind of a training camp, an ongoing training camp, and including the weight training and all those things, because you wanted to make sure that the body doesn't just look very muscular, but that it also looks as smooth and as fluent with its performance with the sword moves and all this. And all of those physical activities had to become second nature. Every fight scene in the movie were approached pretty much the same way, which was that first we read what was on a page, and then we talked to the director and listened to him very carefully of what he would like to see and add and put other dimensions to that scene that maybe is not on the page. So we could ask questions about the fight scene. 
because some fight scenes would involve 20 people at one given time and everyone is wielding a sword and swinging a sword. Some real swords and some plastic swords, fiberglass swords or aluminum swords. So depending on how close one got, this is determined on what kind of a, a, a sword was used or how close you were to the camera to make sure that it looks believable. So we always approached this fight scenes like that. We talked about it and all that. Then the stunt coordinator, Terry Leonard, would go out there with us and he would then choreograph it with the other stuntmen. All the sword sequences were really well laid out by Terry Leonard. You know, he did a stunt there that was unbelievable. He dove out of this, it was like about a 60 or 70 foot fall in this little well. It's one of the scenes where Arnold and Sandal and I sneak into the tower to steal jewels. And she cuts the guard's throat and throws him down the well. And that was Terry Leonard diving down the thing. I couldn't believe he even survived that. He dove into a pile of cardboard boxes. I mean, he's a real old style. You know, nowadays they all use airbags and stuff. The adventures that John Milius and I have been on are really a highlight of my career and he's been a very, very loyal friend, and that's a very rare commodity in this business today. There's people that I've risked my life for that today they can't remember my name, but John does, and that means a lot to me. At that time, my organization do three, four, five pictures every year. I'm gonna be physically in the back of every day in the set for every movie. Then for every movie, I put the producer in charge, and I choose Raffaella, not because she's my daughter, because uh, in the work, I look for the best people. I choose Raffaella because Raffaella was, and is one of the best producers in town. The world of Conan was Germany and Eastern Europe. So we went to former Yugoslavia and we started pre-production on the movie there and we worked there for three or four months. And then we started getting a little bit concerned about the political situation and we decided it was probably safer to move the picture out of Yugoslavia and we moved to Spain. And so we postponed the picture by six months. I remember the whole idea was to start in January because we wanted the snow for the big opening scene in the snow. And of course, as usual, it did not snow. So we started putting this fake snow on the ground and all that, and then we eventually went up there to shoot, and finally it did snow right when we needed it. I always thought that a screenplay should open with something very dramatic, you know, with either dramatic idea or dramatic vision. and. There's nothing like a village being wiped out to open a movie. First thing I asked John is, what is the Wheel of Pain supposed to be? Is it just a big mean thing out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> to torture little kids? <laughs> John kind of wrote as though it was just a big mean thing, and I, I suggest that we, we at least cynically pretend that it's there for a purpose, that it, it grinds grain or something. So I designed the thing to echo some Scandinavian Viking ship carvings and do it all in wood and uh, look just great. But I think the biggest problem we had was that it was so well balanced that when Arnold tried to get on it to actually push the thing, it just in instantly spun, and the next spoke came around and hit him in the back of the head, you know, it's like, there was no effort at all to push it, you know, so for a while there we actually had to have part of the crew, you know, on the other side of the wheel, out of the shot, pushing against Arnold, so that it would look like it was hard to push. Not only did I have nothing on, but they had the wind machine on, the most powerful wind machines, they were like 10 feet high, and they threw snow in there, so the snow blows right into my body. So I said, the only thing I want to ask for is so I can get some hot tea with some schnapps. That's what we ended up doing, so I keep warm at all, because it was like unbelievable cold. But it was a great idea to show first the feet of a little kid, and then of a bigger kid, and then a medium-sized kid, and then finally Conan.
the first couple days of shooting were kind of anticlimactic because the training had been so intense that uh, by the time we got to really shooting, it was pretty easy, you know. Arnold tells a story about the, the wolves really chasing him, and they really were, because I don't think those dogs were very well trained. They attacked their own master several times while we were there. So we uh, did the scene, and they ran, and the first time we shot it without those wolves, and the second time we shot it with it. And uh, sure enough, uh, everything that could go wrong went wrong. I somehow got to the place where I was supposed to climb up and couldn't find my first step. And the next thing I knew was this wolf jumping on my back, ripping me down from the top of the rock and I'm falling down and uh, injure myself. And, and the front of this animal was right in, in my face like this. Ah, ah, just tell totally, and the animal trainer was luckily right there on top of it, pulling it away and stuff like that. So these were the first few stitches. Uh, this was like still in the morning. It hasn't got noon yet on the first day of shooting when I already got my first few stitches with the medic there. You know, and in Spain, it's not a doctor that comes to stitches up your back. It's a medic that just goes, yeah, I got a needle there, and it's stitching you up. <laughs> I'm seeing that the first day of shooting. So it was a quite an interesting uh, beginning, I would say. <laughs> And then I remember the thing where Arnold did fall down the rocks and, and he looks and he's bleeding and he says, I'm bleeding. And I said, yeah, look, it looks great. Don't touch it, you know. And he says, he goes, but, but I'm bleeding. You know? And I said, the pain is only momentary, but the film is eternal. Pain is temporary, but movies are forever. He says, this movie will be forever. There was one accident that was very, very bad for me where my index finger got severed. It was in the battle sequence when we were inside the castle and we were under a time limit and I was working with an extra, probably should have been a stuntman in that routine. And as I remember, the guy did the wrong move, which was called a parry. And his sword slid down and then cut my index finger. It was unfortunate. She cut her finger pretty bad. And they had to take her to the hospital and get sewed up and everything. But the concept of making an action film with major stars, there's always that element of risk. You try and wring out all the options that you have and try and make it perfectly safe, but every once in a while, somebody's gonna get nicked. John Milius, instead of saying, oh my God, are you all right? I remember him saying, Valeria would never let that happen again. In those days, you did not have the visual effects. You could not go and through a computer create the snake and have me maybe fight against nothing and then the snake in later on. Things that we do today. And there they, you had to rely on the craftsmanship and on the talent of the people that would build a mechanical snake. A snake that looks exactly like a snake and has the texture of a snake with gigantic the mouth like this and a really long and big, but it had to really move. When the snake was built, it worked really great, but it wouldn't fit in the set. Only part of the snake would fit in there. You could only push the front end in. The worst part, I remember, was that I had to shoot arrows through it. And I had to do it, because I turned out to be the best archer. And I had to shoot the arrows right past Arnold's head into the snake. That was an easy shot be nothing if he wasn't there, but it really bothers you when somebody's there. I remember one day going to the swimming pool and the guy comes there and dumps in these huge snakes that are like this thick around it. And I'm swimming there and he's dumping in this uh, this uh, these snakes and they were just coming towards me. He says, don't worry about it, they're not, they're not dangerous. Dr. Tiva came onto the set with a variety of snakes for me to get to know. Luckily, as a soldier in the U.S. Army, I was trained uh, with the Rangers and a part of our survival, we had to befriend a snake, which means take a non-poisonous snake and take it into your association, put him in your uniform, uh, let, let him sleep with you, uh, you know, get to know you. And at the end, you, of course, you ate him. So I know a little about snakes. And being a farm boy, I knew about snakes, except as farm boys, we tend to be very hostile to snakes. Uh, a snake was automatically evil, automatically harmful. And so we'd always uh, destroy them. But I learned how to coexist with them. So when I, when I came to the set, I had a little bit of um, background in that already. Perhaps too much because uh, the doctor said that uh, the snake was too comfortable around me. 
and uh, they had to uh, sort of fluff him up to get him moving so he looked live. <laughs> the snake doctor was a wonderful guy, and he just did some wonderful stuff. And he was a really interesting character. He had these beautiful girls that would attend to him, and they would go and get the snakes and bring the snakes to him. And he would give everybody a snake. Everybody had their snake. And he, he said, I can't stand how human beings don't trust and like snakes, because he loves snakes. So he gave me my own boa constrictor, and I'd wrap it around my neck, and I'd leave it there all day. And I was trying to get used to it. And of course, it got used to me, but I never kind of really got used to it. I guess those are those metamorphosis into the snake is best taken for granted. In, in other words, it's best not explained. It is mythology. And any more than you need to explain the unicorn or the satyr, you don't explain those a snake. The idea of him turning into a snake was really kind of that, uh, that he has powers, that he can transmute into a snake because he is the head of the snake cult. The way he changes into a snake was we just made a very, very good mask of him. And then we simply put a snake head armature behind it and just pushed it out. We did have a mechanical snake that comes out of his neck and starts to slither down. And then we made a very good miniature with a very big snake. The temple on the mountain it was the largest set piece in the picture and the one I was most proud of. We worked on the design of that for a long time. I found the mountain, surveyed it, and we got it up as high as we could. John wanted it even higher, but it was going to be almost impossible. It was a big outdoor set. It had to be reinforced to hold 1,500 extras. We didn't have the materials probably we should have had. We did have a construction foreman, Aldo Puccini, he would go out on the ground and he would draw a circle and he would put down a stake and he'd say that's where it's going to be and it's going to start here and it's going to end here and he'd just start building. There was no plans. It had sketches and drawings but nothing else. We love that scene of the crucifixion because it's the reverse of the real crucifixion, you know, where the real crucifixion is Christ is up there and, and he wonders if God has forsaken him and he's helpless and the Roman comes up and sticks him with the lance and everything and says, there, where is your God now? And of course, what happens to Arnold is a complete opposite. It's so unchristlike is that this vulture lands on him and starts picking at his wounds. The gods, in fact, are insulting him. Krom has deserted him. And what does he do? He does what is so great in Ari e. Howard and so great in Conan always, he bites the vulture. He has nothing left but his teeth, and he bites the vulture and kills it and spits it out in defiance. There was actually a real vulture leaning over to me, but then pulling back, and then we picked it up by putting this vulture that just died mysteriously, and I bit into that neck. And the reason why I remembered it very carefully was because right after that, the medics always ran up to me and gave me something to goggle with because of the danger of getting really, really sick because of this being still a, you know, a real thing, you know, except it was now stuffed and all that. But I mean, just very primitively done. He said you were a wizard. Do the gods owe you any favors? When we did the scene where I'm suspended and I'm basically dead and then they had to bring me back to life and they had to put all those different symbols on my body, the makeup department I think did an extraordinary job there. I was always influenced by the Japanese cinema. Painting his face is directly stolen because it came from Kobayashi, Hoichi the Earless. And in Hoichi the Earless, these spirits are gonna come and they paint his face and do incantations, but they forget his ears and they rip his ears off. So we decided to paint his face and that these spirits were gonna come. And of course we painted his ears too, and his hands. And the whole idea of that is, is to show her that she is going to fight them. And she, by fighting them, knows she will drive them off, but she knows she'll pay a price. For me, it was of course not that difficult at all because I was just lying there. I remember I was lying there on that beach 
and these guys were all crawling around me and doing their painting and stuff like that. I fell asleep because it was just so soothing. It was like getting a massage on the beach or something like that. So this was the least difficult moment of my uh, making of Conan. John Milos and I spent an incredible amount of time building model airplanes and painting them in these different camouflage motifs. And I think it was from that that he had this idea, well, let's camouflage the bodies. Arnold and Sandal and I had to go all get painted up so that they could see what we looked like. And John knew already, even before we did it, that it was gonna look good, that's why we did it. The thing about that paint, though, that was so terrible, it was soap-based because they didn't want it to crack. So it itched, you would have this on and your skin would just, oh. As I remember in one of the hotels we were staying in a day of shooting in that war paint and we couldn't wash it off, there was no water. So we had to sleep in it. The real hidden truth of the cult of Set and of the cult of Thulsa Doom was that they were cannibals and that they were eating human beings and tasting of the most forbidden fruit. And so you wanted to see that. You wanted to see all the bodies that are skinned and gutted like animals hanging up. And then the, making the soup, the sacred soup, and carrying it. And we called it split pea in hand because it looked like split pea soup, but you saw these hands in it, you know. <laughs> all these sets, everything always had a, a reflection in history. And so the Stonehenge, there were many all over Europe there were these temples that were built with rocks on top of one another, especially in circles like that and everything. So Ron wanted to do that. And what was really quite amazing was how quickly they did it. We reshaped the desert to build two huge sand hills. You know, the big Stonehenge boulders were all styrofoam and with fiberglass coatings. And it was right on the money. It was exactly what we needed to stage the whole in sequence in. The one trap is really good, you know, where you see him building that. And it really works because you see his helmet and you see him hit it with the hammer, which sets the whole thing off. Then it swings around and skewers him. And I love Arnold where he's looking at Sven hanging on the thing going, what's wrong? Are you upset today? John is a military tactician and he thinks like a military general. So everything that was involved in that final battle from the punji sticks and the spike that went through Sven Ole Thorsen and things like that all came from John. The trickiness of making those things work is to integrate the technology into what we have to do physically with an actor. There was absolutely no animals injured. The only animals were the Great Danes, these huge Scandinavian guys. They were the only ones who were ever injured. But the animals themselves, real animals, were never injured talking about animal rights activists, they picketed that sequence that I was involved in. It looked supposedly so real to the animal rights people that they questioned the truth of the stunt. And they thought that this horse had gone through these punji sticks that were used in Vietnam. And they talked to John about this. And he, I think John's answer to those people was very succinct. He said, ladies and gentlemen, did you see a stunt man falling through those sticks? prior to the horse going through them. When that horse fell down the hill, there was a stuntman ahead of the horse. Do you think the stuntman died? No. Well, the horse didn't die either. They were made out of rubber. The violence in Conan fits. There's no gratuitous violence. There's no making fun of violence. To me, violence is really repugnant when it cheapens human life. One of the things that was very good about Conan as compared to other comic book characters is that Conan could be hurt. Conan was mortal, you know. Conan didn't come through these fights unscarred, either physically or mentally. He wore a specific harness, protected him from the ear to the shoulder, because I was supposed to hack on the beginning of the neck. We practiced it, first with a very light sword and then with a heavier sword. And it was amazing that because of all the practice that we've done for this scene, that James L. Jones felt comfortable enough that he actually himself stood there. 
So I did the scene over and over with him from behind my shoulder, from the side, over his shoulder and all that. And I think they used in a dummy for some close-up from behind where they didn't need either one of us. Dolce Doom is in the movie only as that element that leads Arnold on his quest for revenge. And until Arnold gets underway, he is only focused on revenge. That's all he thinks about. He's not a hero until he goes beyond revenge to kill the evil force for the whole world. Then he becomes a hero. The idea was that was always going to give you a hint that this was going to be more than one movie. It should have been the beginning of the trilogy. The trilogy was each one was, was about something. And the, the first one was about strength, raw strength. The second one was about responsibility. And the third one was about kind of tradition and loyalty. You know, where I was going was that ultimately there are things that people do things for that are, that are larger than them. John wanted Basil to do the score from the very beginning. And we had some discussions with uh, Dino and some of the other people about having uh, Ennio Morricone do it. And, but John insisted that it was something that Basil could do. From the time that I was set to write the music from Conan until I recorded it was probably a period of a year. At that point, before John went off to Spain to start shooting, he had requested that I you know, come up with several thematic concepts for the film. And th these aren't finished pieces of music by any stretch of the imagination. Sometimes they're no more than eight measures of music, a melody, a phrase. So he basically he had the f four, probably four major themes of the film, uh, which, he, which he took off when he started shooting. Conan, however, had some very serious requirements in that you're dealing with prehistory. John always envisioned this thing taking place 10,000 years before recorded history. So what does that mean musically? So we explored the concepts of, oh, we'll use antique instruments. But then we realized that isn't even far enough back. Medieval is, you know, fairly modern compared to Conan. He knew he wanted it to be operatic. There was no question in his mind that because there was so little dialogue, that the music really had to carry a lot of the story. the Wheel of Pain sequence, basically I knew that we should incorporate a lot of metallic sounds and try to get some strange sense of another world. So it, I think we had a couple of chains and things like that going on. We incorporate this Chinese gong, which is made out of very precious metals. And we took a triangle beater and literally had the percussionist rake it across uh, this thing. So as it hits the edges of these things, it makes this scraping sound, and that's, that was the sound of the, the scrape. There's something about the funeral pyre that I think is eloquent. It's one of the smaller pieces in the film in terms of the size of the orchestra, and I think because of that there's an economy of force, but there's also a strident kind of quality to it because I needed fewer instruments to do a lot more. I had also had a dream the night before my wife and my two daughters had gone to Florence, and I dreamt that they had died, and I had this whole image of death and a hooded thing with these ropes for a face, and I could remember every piece of it vividly. It's all part of why I wrote it the way I wrote it, because I wrote it the next morning. I was writing the orgy section of the film. It's just sort of the basic riff. And um, one day my daughter, who was studying recorder at school, walks in and she starts playing a counter melody to what I was doing on the piano. And I thought, this is really good. And uh, I sort of wrote it down and put it on eight French horns, what she was playing. As a surprise, I brought her out when we were recording that scene and, and had her sit on the podium, you know. And I thought she'd be thrilled and it was over. And, I looked down at her and I said, well, Zoe, what did you think of that? She goes, well, you didn't get it right. She already had this concept that there's a way music's supposed to be, and if it isn't that, it doesn't matter. You put it on 20 French horns and it's not going to impress her. Conan was a chance to really speak with a very strong and, and hopefully unusual voice. I think it summed up everything I, I knew about music to that time and also gave me a chance to say, this is my idea about what, what this is. 
the studio was very nervous because the movie was very violent. I mean, at the time we got an X three times before we finally got it to be an R-rated picture. In Vegas at the sneak preview, we showed up at the theater and like an hour and a half before the screening, there were lines around the block, you know, with all these guys and there were all these bikers in leather and chain and they were all waiting in line and there were more people than there were seats in the theater. So we pulled another movie from another theater and we showed the movie three times the same night. We had such a tremendous turnout that we had to bicycle the prints from, uh, from one theater to another. I remember the greatest thing was to go in the theater at that moment that I knew everyone would love, that moment where natural selection has selected him. And he looks up from pushing the wheel of pain and it's Arnold. People went nuts. We really knew when we showed that movie that we had a win on our hands. I became blocked in to a huge machinery, unlike anything that I ever expected in my career, that I would make such a big leap forward and that this could be my chance to step out of my past, the bodybuilding past, and step into the international arena of show business. I often think of the review in Time Magazine, which was very short, which called it Star Wars by a Psychopath. <laughs> They completely dismissed it, you know, it was just claptrap of sword and sorcery and that kind of thing. And yet, it does seem to have an effect on people. I think that I look at it as, in my thing, I look at everything as a battle. Because I always wanted to be a general, I never wanted to be a director, you know. And this was a large battle, this was a divisional sized battle. And it was very carefully designed, conceived of, and executed with great skill and valor, and the battle was won.